All right, I think we can go ahead and uh, get started for today. So I wanted to uh, thank everyone for uh, joining us for our Data Theorem's weekly live demo series. Uh, today we're going to do something a little different, actually do an exploit analysis on the sign-in with Apple um, vulnerability that was uh, that's recently uh, made some news. Um, we'll be taking a look at that in depth. Now before we kind of jump directly into uh, the topic for today, I just wanted to share a little bit about Data Theorem. Uh, we are a cybersecurity company founded in 2013 based out of Silicon Valley and headquartered in Palo Alto, California. Um, we recently have uh, won the uh, Gartner Cool Vendor Award for API strategy. And our company is really based in a history of cybersecurity. All of our leadership team has 15, if not in many cases, 20 years in the cybersecurity space. So it's really based uh, a part of who we are in our DNA. It's led us the privilege to work with a number of amazing uh, organizations and companies as their application security on mobile, web, API, and cloud um, provider across a number of uh, different verticals as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, we are a full stack application security company. We do everything from mobile to web on the client side, uh, API security, and cloud. And today we're going to focus a little bit on, on the iOS side, uh, specifically on mobile. And before I hand it over to Eric Castro, who will be our speaker, I did want to just let everybody know that we will uh, reserve some time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. So if you do have any questions, feel free to put those in the WebEx chat, and then we can, uh, we'll definitely read those off at the end. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Eric. And uh, Eric, uh, I'll go ahead and pass the ball to you so you can share your screen. All right. You guys all hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Eric Castro. And uh, today I will be giving you a quick recap of a recent patch uh, to a very, very serious vulnerability that was found in signing with Apple. Uh, so let's get started. Um, I believe it was on May 30th, uh, an independent uh, researcher from India publicly disclosed a serious security hole, uh, which had the potential of a full account takeover in applications or websites um, implementing signing with Apple, uh, which is Apple's own uh, sign-on solution. But let's go back a little bit and talk about uh, signing with Apple. Um, all right. So Apple introduced it uh, last year during WWDC uh, as an alternative uh, as an alternative to existing single sign-on solutions with the promise of being very fast and easy to set up using your own Apple ID uh, that most people uh, using Apple devices already have for things like uh, downloading um, and purchasing apps from the App Store, or if they're using any of uh, Apple's uh, iCloud services. And they did so uh, with security in mind uh, with built-in features uh, like two-factor authentication, uh, but it was particularly focused on privacy as a uh, top priority, providing a pretty distinctive feature uh, that allows users to not share their real email address during the account setup. So instead, um, Apple hands out a randomly generated relay email address to the uh, third party application, which could eventually be turned off later if the user chose to stop all communication initiated by, by that app. And what's more, um, Apple has warned all developers that signing with Apple must be an option if they are already providing other single sign-on uh, alternatives, um, if they wanted to have their app submitted to the App Store. And this move could have been also be considered an effort to uh, accelerate adoption and uh, quickly uh, establish Apple as another leading provider alongside the other big names, uh, such as Facebook, uh, Google, Twitter, etc. Um, but how does it work? Um, it is very similar to OAuth 2.0, in which uh, an app or a website delegates the authentication process to any of these vendors and uh, making use of access tokens issued by their authorization server that they are, they are then used to access any of uh, the requested protected resources, services, etc. So signing with Apple uh, is provided a native implementation for uh, all of Apple platforms, Mac OS, uh, iOS, uh, iPad OS, 
Um, and then if the developer wanted to implement it in something like a website, then uh, there's a JavaScript uh, SDK for that as well. And then it makes use of uh, JSON web tokens or JWT. Um, they are used to exchange information with the application. Uh, and this is where we'll, we will be focusing for a bit so we can uh, better understand how this vulnerability could have been exploded. exploded sorry. So JSON web tokens. Uh, what are these JSON web tokens or JWT? Well, it is a widely used uh, open standard that provides a format for securely uh, exchanging information and uh, asserting claims that can be uh, signed and encrypted using either uh, secrets or public uh, private key mechanisms. And since it uses JSON, uh, it's a lot more compact than other formats like XML, uh, which is a lot more uh, verbose. And it's self-contained. Uh, we, can, we can put all the information we need within its payload. And then uh, when JWTs are used in authentication, it has the additional advantages of uh, being a stateless way to authenticate a user. If compared to, for example, session cookies in which the server has to store information in memory about the current session and have the browser manage session cookies, etc. In the case of JWT, it is stored in the client side and it's already, it already contains the information that the server will need to consider, uh, such as uh, the user that is authenticated uh, or the role or whatever uh, for, for the duration of the token. Um, the other obvious advantage is that it allows uh, the coupling authentication from the application, making it possible to delegate that process to a vendor we trust, like, like Facebook, uh, Google, or, or in this case, uh, Apple. And finally, um, all we need to authentic authenticate a user is to verify the JWT against the, uh, uh, the authentication server. So it's a, there's minimal authentication logic that the developer has to implement to do this. So what does a JSON web token look like? What are the contents? What's, um, here we have an example in which we can see that it has a, a header that uh, contains a type of token and algorithm used for the signature hash. Then uh, the payload, which contains the set of claims that include the data, such as, like I said, the login, logged in user, uh, the user's role, et cetera. And finally, there is a signature that is appended to the end and is used to validate the contents of the token itself uh, using the algorithm that is specified in the header, uh, which can be encrypted uh, with either a, a secret or uh, a public key, depending on the algorithm that was chosen. And how do we use this token? Well, whenever the user wants to access a protected service or resource, uh, the client sends the JWT in the authorization HTTP header using the better schema. Okay, so now we understand how the JSON web token works. Uh, let's go back to signing with Apple. This is what the authentication flow looks like. In step one, uh, the user begins with an authorization request to the Apple server and logs in using their Apple ID. And once that process completes uh, successfully, uh, in step two, uh, Apple informs the user of the successful authentication, giving at this point uh, things like the choice of uh, using the real email address or hiding it. And once that's done, Apple issues the JWT to that application. Then uh, the application will uh, then use it to effectively log in the user or create uh, the app the account within the app's environment in case uh, none existed before. But for this to happen, the app needs to verify that the JWT that was given is indeed valid. So in step three, uh, when the app tries to use it, the applications backend servers will verify it against Apple servers in step four and wait for a response. So if Apple responds with a valid verification in step five, then the application can finally trust that the user was successfully authenticated 
and proceed in the final step six to authorize use of the content or services within that application for that user. And the vulnerability that was discovered uh, resided in these two highlighted steps of the process. That is, when Apple issues a JWT and when it's verified in their servers, uh, and an undisclosed API endpoint on Apple servers essentially allowed creating uh, JWTs for any given Apple ID that the app will then verify against Apple servers. And Apple would respond saying that the JWT was indeed valid, opening the possibility for, for an attacker to make the app believe that the victim's chosen Apple ID successfully authenticated with Apple and therefore allowing to take over their account. So let's take a look at the bug that made this possible. Uh, according to the researcher uh, that discovered this vulnerability, um, Apple was allowing creation of a JWT for any given email address. And from what has been shared by him, it did so by exploding an undisclosed API endpoint in Apple servers. And that we're unsure if this endpoint is a private one that got somehow discovered or uh, part of the public endpoints that Apple uses as part of the signing with Apple process. We believe that for security reasons, Apple probably asked that this information was not made public. Um, but how could we have potentially exploited this bug? Um, well, the attacker could craft a sort of man in the middle injection attack in which it replace it would replace its uh, it, it, its own Apple ID email address with that one of the victim and by leveraging the valid creation of the JWT from Apple uh, using such address that JWT the JSON web token would then be used to complete the authentication flow within the app and what's more have the app successfully validate such token with Apple since Apple would return that it was indeed a valid JWT, which ultimately would make the app believe that everything went well during the signing with Apple process, effectively granting full access to the victim's account if the app did not provide any secondary security verification mechanism. So now, one thing that is important to point out to, to make a clear difference, um, when going through these steps, only the account in the third party app is affected and the exploit itself would never have allowed uh, the attacker to hijack the victim's Apple account, which is different. Uh, but still, it is a very, very serious security hole that could have been disastrous if signing with Apple became more and more adopted globally by developers and not caught on time. So with such serious flaw, uh, what was the real world impact that it had? Well, Apple has informed that there are no records of exploitation of this bug in the wild, uh, meaning that no accounts were compromised. We do not know uh, for how long this bug has existed, so it is unclear if it was a temporary mistake from Apple that maybe lasted a few days or if it's been there forever and they were just incredibly lucky that it wasn't discovered and massively exploited. And then the researcher who discovered the vulnerability responsibly disclosed it to Apple first and only made it public uh, after Apple fixed the problem on their servers. Finally, he was paid $100,000 as, as part of the uh, security uh, bounty program. But then uh, there's a question that arises, uh, given that these almost embarrassing vulnerabilities can exist totally outside of a developer's control, uh, what measures can we take to reduce the risks of anything like this happening ever again in the future? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about mitigation. Uh, a few things could have been, could have made this exploit not have such a serious impact. Uh, most of them requiring that the third party app implement some sort of additional security security verification mechanism, uh, like two factor authentication after signing with Apple uh, when the flow is completed, or maybe if it was an existing account uh, upon detection of uh, login from a new device, 
the app could do something like uh, ask a security question, uh, plus um, send one of those email notifications that we all love saying that there was a login from a new device, etc. The point is that the app should never fully trust uh, whatever vendor that they chose to authenticate their users with uh, and always provide some sort of in-house uh, secondary verification that is controlled by the app and their servers. And finally, in this case, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a bonus mitigation of this particular kind of bug was that it was re relatively easy to fix since it was an Apple server site and they addressed the problem very quickly, uh, meaning, that, uh, meaning that no action was required from developers. Um, so that's definitely helpful. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much all I had. Um, I hope this information was useful and uh, thank you all for joining. I'll hand it over to Richard. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric. So I did want to uh, move over to Q&A. So if anybody has uh, any questions, um, feel free to drop those into the WebEx chat and we'll give everybody a couple minutes to do so and then we can hopefully get those questions answered for you uh, now. Right, so it doesn't seem like we've gotten any questions so far. Um, so what I'll say here is if, if you do have a question, um, you can always email it to knowledge at datatherum.com and we'd be happy to, uh, to get back to you with the, the answer to that question. Um, also, if you're interested in exploring